first thing is when you get into this business, um, you're going to learn about all the stuff you can do, mm -hmm. all the tools you can use, right? And the first thing to understand is you don't need 90% of it. You, you don't, you're not, you can do anything. You can use anything. You can't do it all. You Go don't ahead. need 90% of, and my biggest pet peeve that I tell new folks is when somebody asks your budget, lie about it, make it always less than it is like super less because in this game, when people ask you your budget, if you got $20,000, guess how much it's going to cost for them to help you. It's going to cost 25. What's up, everybody? It's Jamel Gibbs. Welcome to another podcast episode. This is the Business and Investing Podcast, where you get all things business and investing related. Today, we're going to talk about how you can generate leads in your real estate investing business. Listen, in real estate, the name of the game is marketing. If you're not generating leads, you're not in business, bottom line. So you got to know how to generate leads. You got to know how to talk to sellers. You got to know how to convert leads into deals in order to make money as a real estate investor, especially if you're wholesaling real estate. And that's exactly why I wanted to invite Dr. Leeds to the call. Jay Malloy, what's going on, brother? What's going on, Jamel? How you doing? Thank you for having me. Doing great. Doing great, man. So look, you're all the way up in Jersey. You've been in the real estate game for a little while. And they call you Dr. Leeds, man. How did you come up with that name? Uh, it's crazy, man. I started off wholesaling. And, you know, we can get into the origin story if you want to in a bit. But I started off wholesaling. And uh, I... My, one of my origin stories is I uh, I blew my budget um, listening to Grant Cardone, 10X, right? So I 10X my budget. I did a year's budget in one month, and it was at the time I was doing direct mail. So I basically had the postcards, and I put the wrong phone number on the postcard. So oh. a year's budget, and I was doing, you know, I was doing a, probably about between 15 and twenty five hundred dollars a month in mark direct marketing at the time. So multiply that out by twelve, blown, right? And so now I was sick, and so I had to get creative. And I said, "All right, what am I going to do?" Um, I went to some of the local investors in the area. I met him. One of the guys that I made six figures off. I made a guy a quarter million dollars on the deal I wholesale to him. So I went straight to him because he loved me, of course. And I said, "Hey, give me a marketing budget for three months." And what I'll do is I'll do what I do. Any deal I find, I'll bring to you directly. You get first right of refusal. You got 48 hours. You don't take it. I'm selling it to somebody else and you can get 10%. Um, and it worked. He, he gave me probably, if I recall right, it was probably $16,000. He, he paid me in uh, three installments and I started generating leads and we found some deals. He found another deal and he's like, you're like the lead doctor. And then I was like, aha. <laughs> I'm Dr. Leeds. <laughs> I got the prescription. So, and then Dr. J was one of my favorite basketball players, even though I never saw him play. I just thought he was the coolest dude around. So I like the whole, my name's J, Dr. J, Dr. Leeds. We just ran with it. Yeah, that's dope, man. So look, you, you've been in the game for a little while, man. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, bro, and how you got started? Yeah. So, all right. I was, uh, my background is I'm one of those uh, guys that got more degrees than a thermometer, which I am not really proud of but i am proud because i did it um but so i started off and I, you know i went to i went to school got a degree didn't want to go to work went and got another degree so got my master's um down at university of virginia which i loved it's one of my favorite places on earth and we still the defending national champions in basketball because i know this is going out soon so that's still true um but i went to school got my first job i was a teacher um, I knew that wasn't going to cut it. Wasn't making it didn't match my taste. Um, I wasn't making enough money, which no, not it's the hardest job I've ever had. But um, I went into corporate America. And what I used to do was I used to manage government affairs for real estate and development projects for a transportation company. So anything you do in transportation starts as a real estate deal, right? So you you got an airport, well the airport's on land. You got a seaport. Well, that's on land. you got a bus station, land, a train station, land, a bridge, a tunnel. And all that starts with land. So I started seeing these pro formas or whatever. And I see, you know, I was working down at the World Trade, the George Washington Bridge, all this stuff in New York City, and these multiple billion dollar projects. And I was seeing the money these, 
on these performers. And I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Just so happened, I went on vacation with my, she wasn't my fiance then, but she became my wife. <laughs> and then uh, basically came back home one day. I had just one man of the year. I was feeling myself. I was making a strong, you know, comma in the middle income. And uh, they called me into a meeting. Never forget it, three o'clock on a Tuesday, the day I came back from vacation. Shades were drawn in the room. They said, guess what? Uh, your services are no longer needed. Mm. I was like, yo, what? So to shorten the story a bit, I had a little bit of money stashed. Um, and, you know, I was like, I'm killing this gig. This can happen to me. And I said, from that moment, I'll never forget it. Walking from the train station to my car, I was like, I'm never going to have another job again. So that's where I started. So that's where you started, right? So so you mentioned something I thought it was it was interesting, man. You said the teacher job was the hardest job you, you've ever had, right? Yeah. And teachers don't make that much money. Nope. So if you were able to make it as a teacher, not making that much money, transitioning into real estate, putting in that effort was kind of a no-brainer at the end of the day. Nothing, man. You, 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 Jamel, you're from, you're from Brooklyn, right? I'm oh. from Jersey. I always say Brooklyn dudes and North dudes are cousins for real. You know? real. So I'm not, I'm, I was born in North. I didn't grow up in North, but the thing is like, is there anything you believe you can't do? I believe I could do anything, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's not been ever been a problem. Of mine. And I had pelts on the ward, wall to prove it. Right. So I just look back at my history. Like nobody in my family's ever went to graduate school. Nobody in my family ever did this, this, this and that. Right. Oh yeah. I can do this. So that's, that's, that's how it happened. My father gave me a postcard for a seminar. And he said, yo, I think you might want to check this out. So I went to one of those big box seminars, got all excited, spent like $2,500, came back, I had to run to the bank to get it, came back. Then they were talking about a three-day, went back to the bank, paid for three-day. <laughs> so now I'm all in like five grand, day one. Go to the three-day seminar, man. You know they you know they start talking about 25, 30 bands. And, you know, I told you I had a little bit of a bag at the time and my uh my my girlfriend my wife now was there with me and i spent 25 I spent 25 grand for you know one of these make you rich seminars and uh it didn't make me rich but did I it, it get you, did it change your mindset did it get you started like like what was the benefit it, of the that moment? here's what happened they got me all excited i went to vegas on a on a like for four days all this stuff happened but it's, it's really funny, man. I got a binder as big as like five Bibles stacked up, right? More information than anybody can ever implement at one sitting, right? right? But I was just excited. And I never forget the last 30 minutes after all of that, the three-day seminar, the four days in Vegas, there's a guy, Mark Risco out of Hampton Roads, Virginia. And he said, uh, he said something about wholesaling. And then he mentioned in New Jersey, you should make ten thousand dollars uh, a deal in wholesaling and if you do two that two deals a month you're at basically a quarter million dollars i said oh i can do that that's it that's it and that's where i got started sure man shout out to mark risco too man he's, yeah. he's been on clubhouse with us a couple of times man i gotta that's get him dog. on then we'll get him on the podcast next man get him get, get him that's my sure. dog man he jumped me in the game and i am forever indebted to that man like he said, and it, it was like, I'm telling you, it was like a week's worth of stuff, Jamel. And it was literally the last thing they talked what about, the last 20 minutes. And I was like, that is it. You know, that's that's really what you go to these seminars for. You know, even if you're brand new right now, I'm not going, like, I, I've never been to a big box seminar. You know, I, I'm kind of self-taught, right? But what I always tell people is don't go there with the idea that you're going to walk out there with a the, with million dollars worth of information. What happens is you get one idea, which will make you a million dollars. Kind of like watching these YouTube videos, yeah. listening yeah. to these podcasts. You're listening to, for the one idea, the one thing that you don't right. know that's going to change right. the game for you. So, right. so at the end of the day, in reality, and I don't know who, who the seminar company was that you were working I'm not gonna with. I'm mention them. <laughs> who was it? I'm not going to mention them. Yeah. I don't know who it was, but it might have been worth it. It might have been so, worth it. 25 so mentally... Grand mentally this was my my mind frame right my wife was sitting there and saw me sign this money this mm -hmm. money that can be going into our life i didn't have a job 
she didn't blink. She just looked at me like, you going to do it? I believe in you. You going to do it? I'm like, I'm mm. going to make it happen. I'm talking, you know, all the bravado. Yeah, I I'm going to make this happen. And mentally, that was a commitment to me. Like, I'm not going to tell. I'm First of all, she's not going to see me out here just wasting $25,000. And that's just not a good look. Right. <laughs> that's setting the wrong precedent. Because <laughs> then she might think she could just go blow some money. It ain't nothing. And it wasn't that situation. Um, and then the second thing was, I, if I do it, I'm going to do it. Period. I, I, I'm not here to fool around. And now, even after I gave that twenty five grand, in my mind, I was pissed that I had more information than I, I, I could use. But I thought about college, how much money I spent for graduate school. And I didn't learn everything they teach at college. They, nobody after I graduated said, hey, OK, now we're going to get you your first job and we're make sure you, nobody did that. Right. So if I could make that investment and not reap the return, because I told you my first job was teaching, then I could make this investment because I believe the return here and it's proven to be is far greater than what I, the, the hundred fifty thousand dollars I probably spent on my education. I think this is such a dope story for everybody listening. And the reason is, you know, there's a lot of people who they're on a they're on a fence, right? They don't know if they should invest into their education. Some people, even including myself, I, I've charged upwards of fifty thousand dollars for coaching. But really the price tag is to force you to do the work. Right. So you could take the good with the bad. Right. It was a twenty five, thirty thousand dollar investment. And, yeah, you know, to, I'm, not mad, it. I'm not mad it. But it might have changed the game for you at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Um, I would have heard Mark at that moment when I definitely needed to hear it had I not done it. So right. if that and that being said, it was 100 percent worth it. But by the same token, I always tell people and I encourage them, you know, don't make an emotional decision because that's actually what I did to start. Mm. Right. I say, get the information for free, find people that you're confident will be there to help you um, not do work for you, but be a source and a sounding board and a guide. And don't think twice if you can about working with them. Love it, man. And that's, that's sound advice, man. That's why people come to my YouTube page. I feel like I give sound advice on YouTube. And I invite guests let me, like let me, you. Let me, let me tell you the truth. Let me tell the truth, though. You you give some of the best advice out there. I'm, and I'm going to stop you because I'm going to tell you how I knew you before we ever met. So this is around the time I got started, right? So what year was, was this, this? What year was this, by the way? It's like 12, 13. Okay. It's like 12, 13. So I, I got started. You started when you was 20, 19 or 21? 21. 21. I forgot which one. 21. I started when I was 34. Three or thirty-four, which I'm mad about, but it still worked out. Um, so after this whole story with Mark, I'm home. I'm starting. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm figuring something out. Preston Ely used to own Freedom Soft. That was my guy. Used to have, yeah, yeah, right. And he used to have. Um, I had the first edition of Freedom Soft, and then they had uh, Real Estate Mogul. And so the real estate mogul like newsletter website. So I was on, I, I signed up for that. And they used to do a podcast with Alex Pardo, I think it is. And you were on that. And I listened to it and I was like, yo, this dude, this you were the first person that I heard, one, that looked like me, but two was from the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, whatever. I was like, oh, oh, we we out here. We I must have listened to that thing like five hundred times, dude. And, wow. You know, and it really did. This is not this is not to gas you up. It really did help. It really did inspire me. It really did help me keep going at moments that I was like, yo, this ain't working. Mm. So you I know, appreciate that, man. Seriously, oh, man, sincerely. I, I appreciate you bringing that up, man. I didn't know that. You know, yeah, um, nah, I didn't yeah. tell you because I want. I knew I was coming on here. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, it amazes me sometimes when, you know, I, I run into people on the street. You know, I was in a vitamin shop not so long ago. Somebody ran into me and said, hey, Jamel, you know, I was in a um, I was in a gas station one time in Pennsylvania. Somebody noticed me. I'm sitting in a restaurant and people are like, man, I got to I got to thank you. You know, you absolutely changed my life. And like my really? like my man from my man Rod Long, for example. Right. So he just bought one of my ninety seven dollar courses. And, and this is not to big myself up. Not here to talk about me at all. But 
Uh, he bought one of my $97 courses, man. He was a struggling landscape guy. He was doing long, like uh, he had a, a lawn mowing company. The dude quit his lawn mowing company in three weeks. He made 17 grand and went on to make $3 million. He made half a million his first year, but now he's making like over a million dollars a year. You know what I mean? Talking from about, from being a, a, a struggling land lawn yeah, care guy. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's crazy. Yo, so you man, listen. You, touch. you never know who you touched. You know what I mean? Dope. You know? That's dope, man. That's super dope. And that's, I just wanted to say, tell that story because you give, like I said, some of the best content that I've seen on this subject matter out Appreciate in the game. It. Appreciate it, man. So, look, so you had this corporate job. Uh, they, they pulled you into the office. They had a light bulb over your head in a dark room. And they said, <laughs> they probably didn't interrogate you, but they said, hey, we got to let you go. And you were at the top of your game and they let you go. So how was that transition going from corporate over to starting your own business? Um, it was difficult. It was difficult because when you, I won't say jail, but when you're institutionalized, for, mm. <laughs> right? Because, you know, corporate America is an institution. Education is an institution, like the penal system is an institution, right? But when you're institutionalized, I like to say you're like a zoo animal. You've heard mm -hmm. me say this before. I was, I'm a lion, but I was a lion at the zoo, right? They used to bring me my food. I was fat. I wasn't fat physically, but you know, I'm fat good. every two weeks. That paycheck's coming is good. I'm looking good. I'm living good. I'm feeling like I'm hurting the game. All right. I'm young, you know, whatever. Um, but when I left and when it, well, it left me and I found myself in the jungle, I was still the same lion, but I had to learn some new rules. I had to learn that these same hours don't apply. Saturday was a Saturday. Saturday might as well be Monday. You know, I had to learn a lot of different things about what it was actually going to take for me to sustain success. And that was hard. That didn't come easy and didn't come fast. It, you know, it probably took me six months to find my first deal. Mm. And then you know, I, I rolled out pretty consistently, you know, after that, but it wasn't like every month. It was consistent. It was like every other month, every two months, I would find a deal. Um, and then the hard thing for me was um, it was learning how to not do everything. It took like four or five years of me doing everything and burning myself out. Right. It took me eight, man. It took me eight years to figure that part out, man. I was yes. burning myself out. It's the twice. biggest mistake. Of, yeah. I, and I've been burnt out twice, too, in a shorter time just because, you know, I, I had life happen. You know, my, my my wife had brain cancer in the midst mm. of all of this stuff and she had to recover. But without this business, I wouldn't have been able to be there for her every day. We didn't miss miss a beat. I still made money. It was ridiculous. Like I could not imagine what that would have been like if I was in my job. Oh, it man. wouldn't have been possible. That's that's such a that's such a great story, man. Such a, a, a fantastic thing for people to hear, primarily because, you know, if you didn't have real estate and you weren't making the kind of income you were making, would you think you would have been able to take care of your wife the way you were? Oh, no. And even if insurance would have took care of it, because we did have really good insurance and that did help. Like, I'm not going to downplay that at all. But really. We live in North Jersey. Um, 25 minutes outside of Manhattan and the best surgeon we could find for the type of brain cancer she had and the surgery she needed was in Philly. So mm. that's 90 minutes away. So the surgery was in Philly. Chemotherapy was in Philly. Radiation was in Philly. So we had an apartment in Philly for probably six months or so um, while she was doing some of that stuff. And there's no way I would have been able to swing that and still have to be at work in New York. Like I was there every day, except for when her mother or her, her uh, father would jump in for me so I could go and, and do what I needed to do. So really, so it, it was that time impossible. and freedom. It was that time and freedom yeah. that you had, right? There's, there is no place on the planet that I needed to be more than with her for what she was going through. Like I. I'm here talking to you, and but none of this would really be possible without her. Like yeah. she holds it down and held me down for a little bit while I was getting it together. So, um, yeah, I needed to be there for her. you. You know, how it's like if there's nothing wrong with if there's nothing right with your spouse or your children, you're not right. That's right. And something wasn't right. So, and literally, this happened on the heels of my biggest deal at the time. I just 
got a deal of maybe 60 grand, 70 grand at the time. And I kid you not, next day all this happened. And it was mm. like, oh, but I just got a bag. So I wasn't really worried about the money. I was just like, okay, well, what we got to do? And I right. was able to help take care of her. I didn't even worry about money, to be honest with you. Did not have one thought about money the whole ordeal. So she sparked your interest. She believed in you getting started and you were able to return a favor, man. And it was all because you had that time and freedom from the business, man. Beautiful thing, man. I love I love yeah. my wife. She's going to see this. So I need to say that I love her. I'm thankful for her. She absolutely makes what I do possible. And she ain't seen nothing yet. I love it, man. Love it, man. I, you know, you know, I've been with my wife now. This month is going to make 15 years married, 21 together. Yeah, man. You know? We have four kids, so I know exactly how you, I know exactly how you, I do everything for my family, man. Everything I do, every move I make is specifically for my family and their future. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I, I, I get it. I get it, man. So what type of mindset shift did it take going from corporate into the business world? What type of mindset did it take for you to, to be able to become successful? Well, this, this, this wolf and beard I had on my face, that's a new addition. That didn't exist. I wore a suit every day, even in, you know, 100 degree weather in the subway in New York. Like I was, oh my gosh, I don't want, if anybody's doing that, I'm sorry. I feel for you. All right? But um, the mindset set, what the mindset shift was um, one, nobody's telling me what I got to do. Nobody's telling me. So I need to tell myself what to do. Mm. All right. So what that means, I got to know what I got to do which means I need to be clear about what it is I'm trying to do and what the things are I'm going are necessary for me to get those things done. So I had to get absolutely crystal clear about where my wins were going to come from and what were the most important things to do consistently. That's the number one thing was, okay, I can't just be in here on ESPN and I'm still going to get paid. No, that was the first, that was the number one thing. Hey, you, you want to eat, you got to kill it. Right. So you got to go hunt. That's the first mind shift. Then so I had to learn how to hunt next, which I guess will, will get us into the sort of the lead stuff. But um, yeah, you have to learn how to hunt next. Like, OK, now, how do you how do you find your kill? Like, what is where is it? OK, what's well, over there? OK, so how do you do it? You just can't run up on it and think you're going to score. It doesn't work like that. So you have to learn about the steps that it's going to take to actually accomplish what you want to do. And then you got to be willing to suck at it to get good at it. Like you got to fall on your face a little bit. You got to, you got to be bad. You know, there's nobody that ever got good at something that wasn't bad at it. Like, we call it, we call it failing forward. Right. You know? Right. Right. And I had a daughter at the time. I still have a daughter. She was, I could see her learning how to do stuff and I saw what the process was. So mm -hmm. I learned a lot from her because I could see she was learning how to play basketball at the time. And she was on this team with all boys and she's pretty good, but she saw they were better. And so she had to get better. And it mm. was all a process. And it was like, OK, this is what you got to get to do to get better. And it sparked something in my mind like, well, she got to do that to get better at dribbling the ball. I got to get on this phone to get better at talking to these sellers. And, you know, I just try to learn from everything that's going on around me. Uh, and then, you know, I, I found some people that had already done some business and I just, you know, I threw myself into it, asking questions and, and watching and listening and, and making mistakes, man. So, yeah, so yeah, I've made a few. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure, man. So so we so we're talking about um, how you got started, mindset shift and things like that. And obviously you face obstacles along the way. We spoke about some of those obstacles already. You know, you, you, you face the situation with your wife. You lost your job, things like that. What are some obstacles that you faced as soon as you got into real estate? Like, what, what are some things that people need to look out for? Um, okay. I'm going to talk about the, the real estate obstacles. And then I'm going to also talk about sort of the, the mindset, the, um, the, opportunism, the opportunism that goes on as well. I had this conversation with somebody, I believe it was Friday. First, the first thing is when you get into this business, um, you're going to learn about all the stuff you can do, mm -hmm. all the tools you can use. Right. And the first thing to understand is you don't need 90% of it. 
you you don't you're not you can do anything you can use anything you can't do it all you Go don't ahead. need 90 percent of and my biggest pet peeve that i tell new folks is when somebody asks your budget lie about it make it always less than it is like super less because in this game when people ask you your budget if you got twenty thousand dollars guess how much it's going to cost for them to help you it's going to cost 25 it's going to cost 25 right so you 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 that's the first that that's just a a thing i like to throw out there now from getting started i think knowing like i said there's a million things you can do you can do lease options you can do you can do fix and flip you can wholesale you can you can sell leads you can you know i you can bird dog you can you there's a million things you can do right the thing is to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish like what do you really want you know for me I found wholesaling and I wanted a wholesale deal where I made 10 grand. That's what I wanted. So then that eliminated a lot of other stuff just off the rip. And I think that's the biggest obstacle a lot of new people face is they're not clear about what they want and the way that they can get it. That's right, man. I want to golf clap that, man, because a lot of people will tell you you need all these different things. You know, I'm notorious, man. You know this. I'm notorious for telling people what they don't need. You know what I mean? Right. I believe people need to start from where they are, with mm-hmm. a little capital, and just get to work, man. Because that's the, how I started. You know yeah, what I mean? So I, they worried know, I about problems. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but they worry about problems they ain't got. Exactly. That's my point, man. And for me, people get upset because I'm not selling services. I'm like, look, man, I'll tell you when you need the service. If you want me to sell you a service, I can sell you a service. But I'm telling right. you how I'm telling you how how to go out there and actually do it. You got to get out there and get your feet. Yeah. Your feet wet, you got to roll up your sleeves and get your, your your hands dirty and stop worrying, worrying about all this software and all this other nonsense. Yeah. That's not going to it's going to help you after you have something to actually send to the software. For example, CRM, yeah. you know, you know, I, we, we just had this discussion on Clubhouse not so long ago. Mm-hmm. I said, take a pen and a piece of paper and write that's your CRM. Not write your stuff down for now. Yeah. When you start making money, yeah. get, a, get a CRM. Right. And yeah. some people won't agree Absolutely. with that. I get it. You know what I mean? But. At the end of the day, if you're going to invest anything, invest into marketing your business, which is exactly what I wanted to talk about today, man. So Dr. Leeds, man, they right. call you Dr. Leeds for a reason. Yeah. Um, what, what are some of the lead sources that are working for you and your business right now? What are you what are you seeing working the best for you and your students? Um, well, I teach a, a variety of methods. The, I, I really tailor things for people's personality. Like I'm passive aggressive. I can be aggressive aggressive, but at, by my, my nature, I'm passive aggressive. So I started my 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 business. Um, I was sending postcards, and I was just waiting for people to call me. Right, mm-hmm. and I called directly to voicemail. Leave a voicemail. I'll call you back. Um, that graduated into ringless voicemail because I feel like, hey, if I'm on your phone, if I'm on this thing everybody got with you and you hear my message and I actually give you a message at the right time, you might call me. Um, We've graduated into cold calling just because you can get more done and it's more aggressive. Uh, It's offensive, whereas the first two ones that I mentioned are more defensive. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what you're looking to do. Um, Regardless of which one of those three that I use, because there's other ones that I haven't used, Um, I think the key is one, how many people do you talk to? How many people do you ask if they are interested in selling a house or consider an offer and how many offers you send? Those are the important things. Those are the important things. So for me, as Dr. Leeds, when I'm talking to somebody, what I'm looking to do is figure out how we can generate enough activity so that you can talk to enough people that you will one, get good and get comfortable having talked to that many people. Two, you can know what type of questions are going to be asked. So you're very comfortable with the conversation and, and, and all the problems you may have. And then three, you're actually good enough that because of the work I told you to do, you're going to stumble on a deal because I lied to you and told you to do way more than you have to do to actually get it done. So now I look like a genius. Versus if I lie to you and say, hey, you know, talk to 25 people, you'll find a deal. And it doesn't happen. Now I now I really lied to you and I'm a jerk. But if I tell you, you got to talk to a thousand people and you do it and you find three deals. Oh, Jay is Dr. Leeds is oh my guy. He's everything. So I, I'm conditioning people to do more work than it will take to actually get the results that they want to almost ensure it. 
Love it, man. Love it. So what are some of the lead sources you start off with? Um, here's I, I tell people this widely and freely. The biggest, best, most predictable, most profitable source of, of deals in my business is probate. It's predictable. I can give you the numbers as far as New Jersey and other places around the country, right? I know if I have 150 probate properties that have properties with them, that have pro I known properties attached to them, I know I'm about to make 25 grand. You said 150, right? 150 properties that you know have 150 uh, probate leads or a list of 150 probate cases that you know has property attached to it, I know I'm about to make 25, 25 grand. grand. Know I your know numbers, it. man. KPI, yep, I know right? It, right? So then once I realized that, my question became, how can I get 125 more? Right? And then I realized, well, hold on. There's more probate cases filed that have properties attached to them that I don't know about. So just give me all of it. I'm not going to discriminate. Just give me all of it. And I'm going to talk to everybody on that list. So I find more than 150 and boom, we got a deal. Okay. How do we expand that to another territory? How do we take that model? I tell people that because it doesn't cost that much money. You can get that information for free. All it takes is a little bit of time. Once you crack the code on it, now you can either do it yourself or pay somebody to get it done for you. It's predictable. The county people, like in New Jersey over the last seven years, I can tell you that the the months that probates dip are the summer months, August, July and August, the number of probate cases dips and it dips November, December. And then it peaks February, March, April, May. I know that because I've seen it over and over, year after year after right, year. Now right. this year is a little different because of uh because of covid and everything you know it's just more cases and new jersey was a hotbed for it but um that's been consistent since i've been doing it so that's Ooh, my man. favorite so probate you know i 100 agree that's one of my favorites as well uh in addition to vacant properties yes that's uh, next that's my second that's the second right mm -hmm. so if we had to give our listeners a three to five step process to finding these probate leads what would okay. those three to five steps be all right so this has changed over time and our guy Brandon has actually tweaked it. And I took my, I took his tweak and said, all right, bet we're going to roll with that too. So the first thing is you want to find out whatever region you're in or whatever region you're interested, what County that is. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you want to find out where the County courthouse is and where the surrogate court is. Now they have different names and different municipalities for what they call it. But the key is to call the County and ask something simple, you know, and the thing that you ask is if I needed to file, probate where would I do that at they're gonna direct you to the probate office all right so now you know where the probate office is either you go to, or you call depending on their rules right now in this environment you call them you basically ask them okay well if I need to file probate they told me to come here if I need to look for a case how would I search it how would I find probate cases they're gonna tell you they're going to tell you, then you do it. Now, it's not always that straight line. Sometimes you got to ask three people. Sometimes you got to hear no. Why? Sometimes they ask you a question. Why do you need to know this? Those are things you're going to have to deal with. Never accept no. Understand that that's their job. People are trying to get this information. I used to bring donuts in there. I used to, you know, butter people up. I used, They got used to seeing me. So now they would say, hey, yeah, we got, they, so, there's been times that, I've walked in and they know that I was going to walk in and they've just given me, Hey, Jay, you don't even got to go back to here. So you can develop relationships, but the bottom line is to know where the information is, know how to actually get the information. And then the next step, you said four steps. The next step is to actually reach out to these people and you can do it via uh, a letter. You can do it via phone call. Um, some people text probates. I don't really like to do that. My favorite method with probates is RVM. I love it. I love it. I send a letter in an RVM and I have a sequence uh, over maybe six months that follows up with them on the RVM. Because the thing you have to know about probates is just because somebody filed it this month or last week, it doesn't mean they're ready to deal with the estate's issues. 
So you got to assume that a probate case is not, they're not going to be ready to deal with a house that's cluttered uh, in another state or 45 minutes from where they live. They're not going to be willing to deal with that for another month or two. So you got to be understanding of that. And all you're doing is trying to get on their radar with that first re that first point of contact. And then you're following up with them subsequently. I just did a video. I, in fact, I released it earlier uh, this week where um, I talked about long term and short term lists, mm -hmm. uh, probate uh, being on that list as well, man. And the benefits of uh, understanding that you have to follow up with people over time. You're building a relationship <laughs> with people over time. That's, yeah. a, that's all you're doing when you're in uh, lead generation and marketing and business in general, you're building a relationship with people that don't know you from different modalities over time. So yeah. you mentioned several, you mentioned cold calling, RVMs, you mentioned, you know, uh, even text messaging is another one, right? Direct mail. Uh, these are all different modalities, but you never know what somebody's going to respond to. So you got to try different things and be in front of people all the time. So, so that so that you're in front of them at the right time right. and they're ready to sell. You know, and so the other part, Jamel, in probate is you gotta make sure you're respectful. Right. Like that's the biggest mistake I see people make. They they just, you know, somebody's on the phone or somebody responds to them and they say, Well, oh yeah, my father just died last last month. And they're like, Okay, um, so how many beds and rooms and bathrooms does the house have? Yeah, that's crazy. You have to acknowledge you know, you have to say, OK, I know it's tough and it's, it's awkward, but you have to say, you know what? I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, I like to offer you and your family my condolences. You have to say you have to acknowledge that this happened. Otherwise, you look like a vulture. And once they think of you as a vulture, you're not getting the deal, no matter how good your offer is for them. And sometimes it might not even be good to talk about the property on that okay. initial call. Right. Use that as the as the, the icebreaker and then tell them that you're calling back. Uh, or maybe you send them a, a letter or a postcard or something and then just let them know, hey, this is what I do. Here, here's what I offer. You know, my services that I offer when you're ready to talk about it, we can. You yeah. know what I mean? So you're, you're nurturing the relationship. Absolutely. You, you know have I mean? to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge that. I mean, I'm not saying you have to do it overtly and cheesily. I'm just saying, hey, listen, I know this may not be the time to have this discussion. But in the future, if you're ever thinking about, you know, letting go of the property, I'd love to have a conversation about it. Absolutely. That's all it takes. Yep. That's it, man. That's all it takes. So, so you got the, so we, we, we went over a step-by-step -step process. Some of the things we look, look out for when we're, when we're in the courthouse, when we, when we get the information, we're looking for the personal representative uh, on the property. That's the person that we need to contact. Uh, executive, yep. what is it? Executrix, executor, executor. Yeah, executor, executrix, administrator, right. administratrix. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. We're um, looking for for those people to contact. They're, those are the decision makers, and on the probate documents, you'll be able to get that information. So if you go down to the courthouse and you you finally get in touch with the right people, that's going to get you in, in in front of those documents. Look for those personal re that personal representative. Uh, so that you can be able to write them a letter and also take down all of the beneficiaries information as well. Right. right. Because uh, those are the people who are ultimately going to make the decision. The person is in charge of signing the documents and talking to people. But the beneficiaries are the ones receiving the, 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 the funds. They're receiving the benefit yeah. of the uh, estate. So you definitely want to be looking out for that stuff as well. Yeah. Probate attorneys too, man. I, I get a lot of good deals from probate yeah. attorneys. Uh, you told a story attorney. about that, right? And it's mm -hmm. a great story. And But I want you to tell it here because um, the reason why that story is great is because you're not normally going to just send a letter to a probate attorney and be able to make that relationship. The relationship is going to come, and I tell this people all the time, I don't go to networking events because my property sales and what I'm doing in my business is my networking event. So that probate story you got about the relationship you did with, uh, you, you gained with this probate attorney down your way, yeah. who's bringing deals to you. Just tell that real quick, because that's that's huge. Yeah, yeah. So so basically, I have this, uh, this I met this, this lady through a referral. I, I got a deal. I made like, I think it was like 15 grand just a few months ago, as a matter of fact, from a referral. She worked at McDonald's. She never had a, a $17,000, $20,000 check a day in her life. I was able to All give right. that to her. But she had a relationship with an estate attorney who was handling her estate. 
I ended up handling the whole process for her so she wouldn't have to think about it. And during the interim, I was able to build a relationship with this estate attorney. And that estate attorney, now he, he saw that I proved myself. I basically was able to close deals and I closed multiple deals with him since then. Uh, he's right. handling, I've also sent him some business as well. So he's actually yeah. working on some, some files for us right now. But I was able to build up that relationship with him just by proving myself and showing, hey, I do, I do deals. If you have any clients that need to close on the biggest asset in their estate, which is real estate, uh, just give me a shout. And then we built a relationship over time, man. And that's exactly how you feel. You said, but here's what you said in there that I hope nobody missed. You made this guy money before you ever asked anything for him right. from him. Just like in my story about how I went when after I blew my budget, I went to one of my buyers who I made a bunch of money that I had already established a relationship with. And he smiles every time he sees my face because I basically put his kids through college. Right. So you see what I'm saying? Like you gave you, you provided. I hate this term provide value. Right. No, if I'm involved, I'm providing value. I don't have to tell you. Right. Mm -hmm. So but you did something for this guy before you ever asked for something back. And that's a huge mistake new people make is they come, hey, listen, let me pick your brain. We talked about that before. Hey, let me pick your brain. Hey, um, you know, can you do this for me? Wait, 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 wait. I don't know you. <laughs> Why? <laughs> man. Bro, I get so, it all the time, man. People contact me on Instagram asking for favors. I don't mind helping people, but, the, the, you know, most people don't bring value to the table first. Like you right. said. You know what I mean? Right. So it's, it's always an ask before they can prove themselves rather than the other way around. How about you prove yourself, then ask. Uh, a good way to do that, hey, I'll work, for you for, I'll work for you for free for six months. You know what I, I mean? I make cold calls for you. I want to talk to a thousand people. Right. And let's see what happens. Right. Just provide me a dollar or something like that. Like anything. You know, but Anything. people don't do that. It's always a selfish reason people are contacting you. But in business, when you understand the concept of uh, bringing, uh, like you said, I know you hate the term, but bringing value to like people it. first. If you can do something for somebody first and they can see the value in you, then ultimately they're going to want, they're naturally going to want to do business with you at the end of the day. That's yeah. just the way, that's just the nature of the beast, right? Yeah. You know, so- yeah. That, that's kind of like the concept of offering. You ever visit a website? They give you a free checklist or a free ebook or something like yeah. that in exchange mm -hmm. for your email address. That's yep. the same exact concept. They're, they're yep. providing something for you, but you got to give something in exchange to get that, yeah. whatever it is that it is. You know what I mean? It's a principle. There's a principle behind gift giving in certain cultures, right? Like you give gifts, you know, you're giving a gift. Yes, it's a nice thing to do, but it also sort of, if the gift has some intrinsic value, at least it, it provides sort of like a connection between people, right? You're just, you know, uh, uh, I can't even think of the word right now, but mentally it's like, you're more likely to be attached to somebody that has provided something of some value to you than you are. Somebody's just requesting something from you. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, you know, um, nuanced way of creating a tie between you and someone else where it's likely something good is going to come out of the relationship that people just it's ignored. They call it the law of reciprocity. Yeah, there you go. I was trying to get to it. I couldn't. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And yeah. A good example of that is one of uh, one of my followers on IG sent me this shirt. He sent me like a T-shirt and the T-shirt says closer. It's dope. I was going to wear it this morning, but I was rushing. So it's dope closer right and he sent it to me i took a card i took me i took a thank you card i wrote the thank you note and sent it to him right what i didn't know was it was his wife that was sending all these shirts out yeah he told him hey here's jay's address blah blah but what i what he sent me back was his wife took a screenshot of the thank you card sent it to him and was like do you know how many people we've sent shirts out to for free we've sent dozens and dozens of shirts out for free and this is the only time anybody sent us a thank you card yeah. and so what i know right now is in her, at least in his wife's eyes i can do no wrong <laughs> and, and that's right and that was the gift the gift of appreciation yeah 
because now I strengthened the bond. He gave me a gift, but I gave him a gift that had intrinsic value. Like, hey, I appreciate the gesture you made to me. I want to make sure that I go out of my way to show you that. And and these are the little things that I think make my business special because I try to do those things as much as possible. I try to provide those little touches to people that, yeah, I, there's people with way bigger businesses than me. Mm -hmm. I freely admit it, but I also have a great lifestyle and I do okay, right? So, but there's people with smaller businesses than me. What I try to act like, regardless of who I'm working with, is I'm just Jay. I'm just Jay. I love it, if man. You know Jay, you know Jay. Love it, love uh, it. You know Jay, I know Jay. You know Jay, how you know him? It's Jay. I don't know. And that's what I want. That's always, so the fact that you've got me on here, the fact that Brandon got me on Clubhouse is amazing because I'm a ghost. <laughs> I don't like to do this stuff. No doubt. No doubt, man. You know, speaking of which, obviously we can't cover everything in mm -hmm. a certain amount of time on a podcast. I know we're in Clubhouse together every single day, Monday through Friday from 5 to 6, sometimes 6.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time. If you guys get an opportunity, come check us out at the Real Estate Roundtable Happy yeah. Hour. But in addition to that, how can our listeners get in contact with you, bro? Yeah. All right. So the best way to find me is always going to be Instagram. And I keep it simple. It's Dr. Leeds, D-R period L-E-A-D-Z at the end. Uh, so Dr. Leeds on IG, you can DM me. I think there's a link in my bio where if you're new and you just like to talk to me, I, I reserve a few spots every week for people to be able to just schedule with me and I'll give them 20 minutes or so. They are a limited number of spots. I can't do it for everybody. So if you're interested, go in there, keep banging that link, find one, get on my calendar. I will do a one-on-one, -on -one, just talk to you, see how I can help you, whatever you need, whatever questions you got. I'm proud to do it. I'm happy to do it. I love doing it. Excellent, man. And I'm going to tell y'all, Jay is dope. Definitely get in contact with him, take him up on that offer. Definitely schedule a call. I don't know too many people want to take the time out of their day, especially having their own businesses going to be able to talk to as many people as possible and help people out. So definitely take it, take them up on that, up on that offer. Now, obviously, uh, as a business owner, you mentioned you, you spent a lot of money on education earlier in the call. Uh, are you currently reading anything uh, that's yeah. helping you in your business right now? Yeah, yes, very much. I'm reading. I'm just finishing up a book by uh, Jonah Berger called Contagious. And uh, it's something that, you know, I didn't know I was doing. It's about how marketing and how things stick and go viral. And, um, you know, you've heard me say this term bef before, and I I've been talking about blue magic for almost a month, mm -hmm. not really just, you know, blasting people, but just throwing it out there. Now, you know, we're doing some things and now it's gotten to the point where people are DMing me like, hey, what's up with the blue magic? Can I get the blue magic? And they don't even know what it is. And that book is really good. And I'm, it's helping me from on my marketing agency side, but it's also helping me sort of dial in my messaging on my real estate marketing side. I want the goal for me at this point is for if a seller comes in contact with the piece of our marketing, be it a voicemail, be it a piece of mail, be it even a phone conversation, that there's something memorable there that's going to stick so that no matter what, whenever they talk to one of my guys or they talk, they see a piece of mail or they get an email, it's going to be something that sticks there that they can share very easily with somebody else. That's what this whole Blue Magic thing has taught me as well, because now people are sort of it's bubbling a little bit. Um, which is exciting, but I want to create that same type of uh, energy uh, in the real estate space with my sellers. I think about American gangster every time you hear, every time I hear and that. That's why I said I'm borrowing. <laughs> I'm borrowing some of that cachet, you know, no cheaper product at a better price. I mean, excuse me. It, it was it's, it's a, the cheapest product that's at the highest quality. Yeah. You can't beat that. Right. So that's what I want people to think. That's what, hey, that's what this blue magic is. You're not going to be able to beat. What we provide you with so stay tuned tap in with me if you're interested and we we gotta we gotta mention jamel gibbs in my dms and i, I got something a friends and family treat for you absolutely brother now listen man if you had to provide our listeners with any last words what would those words be first thing is keep listening jamel i listen to him every day monday through friday <laughs> five to six thirty 
I learned more in the month, month and a half we've been doing this, just little tiny things, just listen to this dude who's been doing this for 20 years and does two contracts a day, you know, does all types of craziness. You know, he's out here buying his wife stuff for the anniversary. I'm like, damn, I got to tuck mine in, make sure I go get my wife something good this year. So listen to Jamel because you can do far worse than learning from him. The second thing I'm going to tell you is this. Get started. Don't quit. Right. Go hard, but stay steady. That's dope, man. I love it. I couldn't have said that better myself. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we mentioned something earlier that I, I just want to reiterate. You got to fail forward. You guys got to get out there, take massive, massive, imperfect action. Right. I don't know where I heard that before. I've been saying take massive action to get massive results for years. Somebody uh, added to it and said, take massive, imperfect action. Yeah. Right. You can't be perfect. Don't wait until everything is all you know fine and dandy or you think because at the end of the day, you're never going to get started. Right. So you have to get out there. You have to take action in order to get the result that you want. But it all starts with you doing something. You have to right. do something. Right. And if you're not doing something, then you don't want it bad enough at the end right. of the day. You right. know what I mean? Now, and I would just add, be clear, get clear, like that should be the first step. Before you start taking action, let's get clear about what is mm -hmm. the end point and keep that in mind while you're taking action because that's going to help you get over whatever mountain it is that you got to climb. Absolutely. Now, you, you can learn a lot from us on Clubhouse. We have discussions like this all the time, every single There's day. five of us. Yeah, absolutely. And we kill it every day. Our room is growing. Make sure that you're, 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 you definitely get, get over there and subscribe. Follow that room. Uh, again, it's the real estate round table. We do a happy hour. And in addition to that, you know, make sure, like Jay said, get clear on what you want. You know, I, you know, we had this discussion on Clubhouse already where I said you have to be clear on what your five year game plan is. And, I've, I, and I tell you guys this all the time. Right. This is not nothing new for you. Right. To understand. You got to get clear on what the end goal is. If you're clear and you know what you want then getting there is, is not going to be an issue. You All you have to do is know what the end goal is and backtrack off of it, right? So get clear. Once you're clear, take massive action in order to get the results you want. And you'll be able to accomplish anything you want out of this business. Anything you want in life, you'll be able to accomplish it. But it all starts with the one thing, getting clear. And then the second thing is taking action. Right, Jay? You got it, man. I ain't, I ain't got nothing to add to that. Absolutely, man. So look, it's been a real pleasure. I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. it has been a lot of nuggets. This has been one of my favorite podcast episodes that we put out. Uh, definitely go back and listen to it again, because there's a lot of jewels that even for myself, I need to go back and listen to it again. And I know you guys are going to benefit by doing that. So listen to it, share it with all your friends and make sure you tell everybody about uh, this channel and also contact Jay on IG. I'm going to leave all this information in the description box. I appreciate you guys very much. Looking forward to dropping another one for you real soon. Talk to you on the next one. Y'all be well.